So this being the last week, I thought it would be wise to just go over some key, not everything, but just a few things. Uh, realizing our value comes from God. Uh, we're all made in the image of God. Um, and so when you see another person, uh, whether they look like you or not, uh, you have something in common because you both are made in the image of God. Um, uh, diversity is a gospel issue. Um, we see that over and over. Um, we see that in with creation of man and woman. What do we see there? Different. And what else? There, that's there too. What else? <laughs> Complementarian. So the woman compliments the man. Uh, also, uh, we see that. We also see uh, diversity. It's man and woman, two different, and yet they come together in what? They're one. So we see that. Uh, what do you remember from uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 22? Remember who we were? Which was? alienated, estranged, far off. Who are we now? Broke near, made one in Christ. This is, review is so fun, isn't it? <laughs> Woo! All right, okay. <laughs> All right, and what do we see in Matthew 28, 18 through 20? In Revelation 7 and 9. All nations, all ethnic groups, the gospel and diversity go hand in hand, right? And also, what do you see was so miraculous about Revelation 7 and 9? Yes, right. They're worshiping the Lamb. Every ethnic group you can think of, every type of language, they're there all representing, uh, praising Jesus Christ as one. So uh, really good. So diversity is a gospel issue. All right? We already talked about our value comes from God, which means everyone you see, we're all equals. There's no one that's better than the other person. There's never uh, uh, ideology of superiority. And if you do have that, it's because you've forgotten that your value doesn't come from you. It comes from God. So everyone has value because we're all equal. We all have value and worth. Everyone is a fellow image bearer. So no matter who you see, no matter what they're going through, um, they're a fellow image bearer. I remember one time, um, this was maybe 12 years ago. We're downtown uh, at a former church, and we're outside just talking. This guy walks up, and I mean, he looks grimy, like he's about to ask you for your wallet and everything. I mean, he's looking. So I got my hand, you know, I had a little pocket knife, and I got my hand, and my, the pastor at the time, he was just calm. He was like, uh, the guy was talking, he was nice to him, and the guy left, and he says, Here's a lesson. Had it not been for the grace of God, uh, you'll be in that same situation. But also, that's the son of Adam. So we're fellow image bearers. And so he started teaching theology there. And I'm like, wow, okay. And so I never, I never met a stranger prior to that. But I really never meet a stranger now because just talk to people. And it's amazing. You might can deter some activity in your life if you're just friendly and nice to people you know and so uh um, all people have value and worth and when you treat people like that a lot of times you get that back or people respect you and like oh uh, um i appreciate you uh also similarity is not necessarily bad remember we talked about that no okay all right well, galatians 2 11 and through 21, what's happening there? Uh, 
Paul, Peter, Gentiles, Hebrews. <laughs> All right. That's right. Because they're both Jews, and he says, if we're um, justified by faith and not by ceremonial things that you're doing according to the law, why are you acting one way with this group and one way with this group? So because they were similar, fellow Jews, he was able to talk to him, right? What do we see in Titus 2? Older women. Yes, right. It's, yes, that's what I want. Yes. Teach the younger women, older men. Yes. So uh, then leave that up to the pastors and then leave that up uh, to the deacons. Uh, there's similarities there because older women know something about being a woman that a guy wouldn't know, right? Older men know something about being a younger man, right? Um, prime example, she's not here today. But she was like, I'm in that stage of my life where I'm going, every day is a summer. And the lady next to her was like, yes, I understand. I don't know anything about that, right? Uh, but because they're women, they, they have similar um, interests. They have similar experiences. And they're able to help one another go through those. So similarity is not necessarily bad. Uh, we also talked about pay attention to what threatens church unity and where do we see this acts chapter six what's going on yes yes so you got greeks and hebrews and you say you know what the widows are not being treated right so uh, the apostle says you know what pick out seven men uh full of the spirit and have them to take care of this because we have to be about the word of God. And something interesting that we pointed out that, that all seven people they picked out had Greek origin names. So they're honored uh, by picking out those individuals. Um, so they understood it was such a big deal that they called everyone together and says, you know what, let's talk about this. Because they realized that unity and diversity is a gospel issue. When uh, you have a collage of people together and Jesus Christ is your only, only thing, only glue that holds you together, it says something. It says the gospel works. And when you have churches fighting and bickering, it says maybe your gospel is not what you think it is. And it gives the world a stone they can throw at the church, right? Uh, protecting unity is a stewardship. It's not only the job of the deacons structurally within the church to maintain unity. It's the job of each and every one of you to maintain unity within the church. Um, I mentioned an example uh, about this lady uh, saying, hey, I waved at her, and she didn't speak to me. And the pastor said, you know, she has cataracts. So she can't see you. So maintain that unity because she could have been like, all right, I'm not speaking to you. You know, she just, you know. But now she sees, you know, maintain unity at all costs. Well, don't maintain unity when someone is sin. You have to call the person out on that. Uh, uh, protecting unity sometimes means overlooking certain offenses, right? Sometimes I got to take something. Okay, uh, maybe this person is going through something. Maybe they're having a bad day. Or Herschel mentioned it one time, uh, you go to a fast food restaurant, and you want your food right there, and this person is struggling, and you're like, all I asked was no mayonnaise. You couldn't get that right. How hard is that? You know, uh, but just having that patience to say, you know, what, it's OK. If you have a, a butter knife, I'll scrape it off myself. No big deal. Next time, just no mayonnaise. You know, I understand they might be dealing with something in their own life. Uh, so when I go through grocery store lines, uh, watch the cashier, watch their body language. Um, a lot of times people's like, I'll be 32. 
All right, thanks for coming to Kroger and Walmart, and they take their stuff and go. I was like, hey, how are you doing? Been pretty busy today. Try to get some type of conversation like, hey, you you actually are a valuable person because if you wasn't here, I'll check out my own groceries and self-scan, you know. So, or just talk to them. Let them know their value. Um, I talk to my garbage people. I wave at them when they come pick up the garbage. I talk to my postman to say hey to him. I want them to know you're valuable. I know you have a job, but think about it. If the garbage people did not pick up trash, it would be very bad. So be nice to them. They're, they're doing you a favor by picking up. And I know we pay for it through taxes and stuff. But, hey, I appreciate it. Uh, during the holidays, you see how important it is to have a trash person. Uh, Christmas, all this gift wrapping, all that is in the trash. Thanksgiving, all this stuff in there from family over. Yeah, you see the need for it. Um, so today, we want to talk about uh, counsel for the majority. So, we'll be looking at Romans 12, verses 9 through 13. Yes? Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Right. 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 Yeah, I think I think that's good. You give up information, but I think it's uh, probably m not more important, but equally as important uh, as you engage that person in conversation. Yeah. Yeah, right. I know, I know. I'm not saying you. I'm just saying that in general. Yeah. Uh, it's always important to do that because uh, people want to be valued. Uh, Romans 12, 9 through 13. So want to run a... One verse, I'll read it all. Notice the context of these verses. What do we see in Romans 12, 1 and 2? Yeah, and you see that in verse 9. But what do you see in Romans 1 and 2? Yes, and what else? By? Yes. So as a result of what Paul has already talked about, um, there's a work that your mind should undergo as being a Christian. So has, how, how you view things in life is through a Christian lens, through the Bible. So there's a renewal of your mind because you're in Christ. And as a result, your behavior should be different. So he's talking about um, let love be genuine. Um, also, you see in verses um, it says, "Let nothing be done out of envy." Do you see that in the next session? Section. Yay, nay. I pulled it up. It's right for I want to say verse four or five. Verse 3, what does verse 3 say?
Yes. So everything that you're going to do in order to have genuine love and to practice verses 9 through 13 all starts with uh, being in Christ, your, how you look at things, a renewal of your mind, but also not to think of yourself more highly than you ought. So you see uh, sort of correlation with uh, Philippians chapter 2, how Christ humbled himself, although being equal with God, uh, didn't think it uh, something to obtain or hold on to, but made himself of a lowly estate, even uh, humbled himself to the point of death of the cross, on the cross. So you see this, your renewal of your mind affects your attitude. Uh, he says in verse 3, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. And why? Because, as we reviewed, we're all fellow image bearers. And so any value that you have comes from God, and it doesn't uh, reside or originate with you. And so when you have the uh, right understanding of who you are in Christ, it translates in how you communicate to other people, how you treat other individuals, how you look at other individuals, how you see different circumstances in life. So it's so important. All right, so question. Uh, it probably should be who among you would consider yourselves in a majority. Uh, I was, was late last night. I was thinking, which one of you? All right, okay. All right, so raise your hand if you think you're in the majority. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. All right, all right. God, that's You get the, ah, there you go. That's right. Majority of what? We can make assumptions. And it's like, hey, we're in the majority. And I'll deal with that in a minute, dealing with assumptions. Uh, yes. All right, who's in the mi minority? You know, oh, oh, that's me. I'm a minority, right? Um, remember the categories that we talked about, right? Don't forget that majority and minority are bigger than ethnicity. Also, here, remember these characters we talked about? Age, your life stage, you know? Personality, education, economic status. There's a lot of um, demographic uh, or characteristics about your life where you could be the majority in one area and could be the minority in another area. And so that's key. Um, and sometimes um, our assumption is we're the majority, uh, and most people have this situation. Most people think like this, so uh, what's wrong with you? And so uh, that's so in key. That's so key uh, moving forward. And I just said this. One can be the majority in some and minority in others. All right, so as... Um, the lesson moves forward. It talks about in Romans 12, verse 9, about genuine love or what it said, let affection be genuine or what does it say? Say it one more time, I'm sorry. Yes, let love be genuine. What does it mean to be genuine? Consistent. What else? That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. 
Right. That's right. Uh, your perspective on how you see situation, your perception lends towards value. Your perception of a situation, your perception of an individual uh, lends towards your value. So if I perceive you as being less than made in the image of God, I don't value you, so I treat you as such. And you were saying something. Yeah, being real. That's right. Uh, uh, we don't have to pump you up. Uh, it's just it's just who you are. You don't have to get a, a effort to get you going. Uh, this is who you are all the time. You know. Go ahead. And it starts, so it starts with verse one, and, and two is, is is bearing yourself. Right. Right. This it's a. Mm-hmm. That's right. That is so key. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, following Christ is a one-time decision, and yet it's a daily, everyday decision. Um, how I treat my wife, how I treat my kids. Um, I got on to my youngest son about something, and I was like, Daddy's wrong. I assume blah, 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 and I said, you forget that? He was like, yes. And so I, I want to let them see that daddy makes mistakes. Um, I see uh, this week Anna's been extra stressed about her big bosses coming in town and stuff. And so I've been trying the last couple of weeks in preparation, doing dishes, washing clothes. I got up this morning and did a load just to say, hey, I appreciate you, you know, and I know she – the kids, they just there, you know. I was like, hey, could you clean up? Can you do that? they like, ah, uh, you know. And so uh, just trying to do little stuff to say, you know, I love you, and it's more than just lip service. I want to be genuine. This is who I am. And, and people can tell when you're really genuine. Um, it's when you have to strain or strain put forth a, a large effort. This is just who you are. You're authentic. Here's an example of people who are not genuine. Hey, how are you doing, Brian? Hey, uh, you, we just really value you. And, and if you act right now, there's a Disney vacation you can get. Five nights and four. And at, if you act right now, we're willing to give you $200 voucher while you're there for spending. I'm like, wow. You know, no, <laughs> they're not real. I mean, they're putting on an act to sell you something. Or you'll see the infomercials. Uh, they create a problem that you don't have and then give you a solution. Have you ever had ketchup on your bib, you know, or on your shirt? Now you can get these bibs that act as blankets, you know, and make something. It's like, oh, I got to have one of those. Oh, you know, I can eat and nothing. Look. And it's washable, you know? And it comes in three different colors, stripe, polka dot. Ooh, we got to get those, you know? Or Snuggies, you know? Uh, so all these little things, you know? Your pillow can be an animal at night, you know? And the kid's are like, oh, I got to have it. Or a nightlight, you know? Uh, all these things, they create demands for stuff we really don't need. Um, they're not really genuine. They're trying to sell you stuff. And that's mostly what commercials are. They're trying to sell you something. Have you ever seen um, a Whopper commercial and how the, the bun is smoking, the patty flops down, and there's lettuce and tomato, water is beating up on it, everything's sitting right, and then you get a Whopper, and you're like, this looks nothing like the commercial. Can you put some more lettuce on here? And the it's sort of lopsided. No, everything uh, is... Not genuine. It's to sell you something. Um, that's what sin is as well. Sin always make um, 
something undesirable desirable. And when you partake of it, you realize, wow, it's not really what it said it would be. And, but you want to be genuine all the time. On the next is self-forgetting. And we just saw that. It says, let each one of you not think more highly of yourselves than you ought. And the only way you can do that is by forgetting who you are. In Christ, my job, the best job title that every Christian has, the only job title that every Christian has, is what? Yes! (laughs) He who is going to be the greatest among you must first be a what? Servant. You have to be willing to serve even to be a disciple maker. Servant attitude. Christ didn't come to be served, but he came to serve. That's our greatest title as a Christian. In order to make disciples, you got to be willing to serve. In order to be friends with somebody, uh, you got to be willing to serve. Everything revolves about, around servanthood. And it's so much so that the business world takes up the mantra and teaches that. Um, how can you serve your fellow co-worker? Servanthood. They've taken that and they're twisted and they use it within the business world. Hey, we just want to do this for you because it's the right thing to do. When you're making business deals, uh, uh, account manager, that's servanthood. Hey, we know you only bought this, but we want to throw in this too. That's that's. Next account, hey, there are good, there are good people to do business with, you know. Hey, we just thought about you. Merry Christmas. We want to send you this pen and notebook, you know. Uh, talking to um, Tim Elmore uh, last Saturday. He came to do a, a training about how to reach the next generation. We invite a lot of churches to come to it. And he had this, like, this notebook and had all these, uh, was it Tim? It was a journal. It had all these pictures in it. I don't think it was. Maybe it was. But anyway, this journal that this person had uh, had all kind of stuff in it. It's real nice. Different pictures. It's to develop creativity. He says, I was doing business with this guy, and he sent this. And so every time I write or journal in his book, I think of his business. You know, so simple things like that. It's just nice to be nice. Um, you only can do that by self-forgetting. Uh, instead of honoring ourselves, we should compete to honor each other. Uh, just really thinking of ways, acts of kindness. We see it here, uh, uh, clergy month, how we honor those in ministry here. Went to their house and did yard work, um, and it was publicized. Hey, show up and just want to say, hey, we appreciate you serving here. So uh, real nice stuff. Uh, uh, the best thing, this is a prime example where you can see the need for self-forgetting. Teams that are really doing well and uh, starting to park up for NCAA are the teams who share the ball. And the teams who do not, they're losing games. You see the teams who are, it's about me, I'm trying to go pro, look at their records. You can look down uh, through all college. And you see the teams who are sharing the ball. Uh, Different game. I saw this this weekend as well. If a guy comes down and he's like, hey, I know you're open, but I want this shot. The rest of the team's like, okay, you're not passing anywhere. I get the ball, I'm running, and I'm looking to shoot too. But when there's a sharing uh, of the ball, the teamwork is different. And the same thing within the body of Christ. When there is a natural outgoing of, hey, I appreciate you, willing to give the extra hand to help out in the situation, it'll come around and you'll see it spread. Um, One reason I love um, the concert we just recently had is Saturday morning there was volunteers. Guys just showed up like, I really don't like the music, but the church is doing it. We're in here to help. And so guys are, we're setting up a stage. It was awesome. Everything you saw there, we set it up early in the morning. Piece by piece, literally. <laughs> Can you move this out of the way? It was, it was nice. Uh, and so it's 
always awesome to see we're coming together. Or serve Frankfurt is another opportunity where you see we're just serving the city. Say we appreciate you being partners. The firemen, the policemen, uh, they appreciate that. Um, Simon House, all these little different things you do uh, as we do as a body. Uh, it really helps. You only can serve if you get, forget about you. Because uh, you could be, well, you know what? Ugh, that's a little nasty and grimy work right there. I don't really do that. You have something else you can sign me up for? Um, I just got this manicure the other day, and I don't want to ruin it. Uh, I might get paint in my hair. You have something else? Now, I don't deal with kids. I don't, you know, it's like, what do you really want to do? Well, I want to serve, but it has to be the right opportunity for me to serve, you know. But as the body of Christ, you say, hey, wherever you need me, plug me in. That's what I'm going to do, right? Right, right. Which is not self forgiving because it's no longer about showing honor to this person. Mm -hmm. Look look how I showed honor. Honor me for showing honor. Yes. And, and that's a different rule. I think it's particularly one knowledge. Like even in the marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Like that, right? Right. Man, I, I, I'll, I'll out it. Feel, feel bad about this. Right. Did you see I did the dishes? <laughs> I do do that. I do. Yeah. I do. Because I don't do it that often. So I'm like, hey, I am doing it. <laughs> That's yes, right. 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 That's right. That's right. And so uh, we actually talk about that in here or on the questions at the end. Are you willing to do something without being noticed? Are you willing to go unnoticed? Um, and so that's slide eight or nine where it talks about are you willing to go unnoticed? Are you willing to do something? Just to, just to do it because I'm genuinely trying to do this, or are you doing it again? Hey, we, and I'm posting this, okay? Or you know, companies that say, well, we're doing this, and we give back to the community too. Look what we've done. Uh, so we, we're, it's not just about what we want to do, we're giving back. So it's like a double edged sword sometimes, and it really comes down to your motive behind doing it. Uh, I know sometimes um, in my line of work, kids are on social media. So I have to sometimes repost or Facebook to say, hey, this is what we're doing. You ought to come on board. But there are some posts that I'm like, hey, watch, look here, you know. And so, again, it comes down to the heart. And you're right. Um, the temptation is to glorify me. Uh, you heard... Um, I don't know if you watched it last night, but Melvin Booker won a three-point shooting contest. And his comments was like, I'm just glad I was here. I just want to make a name for myself. And so, uh, you know, I, I want to I want to give take something back to Phoenix Suns. It's different, different mantra. Um, so we have to really keep that in mind. Or we're trying to promote ourselves, or we're trying to promote the team, in this case, the body of Christ. Or you hear people say this, and I know they have good intentions. I just want to make Jesus famous. And you want to say, uh, he's already famous. <laughs> he made the world. You ever heard of him? <laughs> Stars, the moon. <laughs> it's historic, you know. <laughs> the one of a kind. He did that. <laughs> it's like, uh, so you hear a lot of people, like, man, I just, I just want to make Jesus famous. And I'm like, he's already famous. Every knee is going to bow. Everybody's going to know Jesus' name. <laughs> Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. How much famous can you be? Everybody's going to say Jesus, and they're going to bow down, either in victory or in defeat. But everybody's going to bow. And so Jesus is already famous. And so uh, I think what they really mean uh, which I hope what they mean is I want to share Christ with the nations and let his name be known. But uh, 
Uh, I hate the word in. I want to make Jesus famous. He's already famous. He's God. Uh, um, so here's some, uh, the next thing is avoiding cultural assumptions. And a lot of, it's embedded in us. Uh, we grow up with these assumptions, and it affects us so many ways. Uh, I'll get to this in, in a minute. I should have had that where it pop up later. So you already got this. So, All right. All right. For example, all blank people are this way or that way. We make assumptions. Uh, one stereotype for African Americans Sometimes I hear it, always late, so always purposely try to be on time. And when my wife and kids are rolling with me, I'm like, ah, come on, let's go. You know, I, I don't want to be the family I always, oh, okay. You know, so uh, <laughs> that's something I fight hard against. And I think it's the military, too, in me. My dad was always on time. And going to ROTC is to be early is to be on time, to be on time is to be late, and to be late is to not show up at all. So that's why I teach my boys. We won't always live up to that, but that's our mantra. Uh, so are all Asian people smart? None of these stereotypes, you know? Uh, you have to really uh, avoid that. Because even if you don't... Um, purposely say it, sometimes it's embedded in the fabric of how we think. And sometimes it can affect us doing ministry. Uh, mindful of this when you speak. So you might not be aware of it, but it comes out in your communications to others. Um, you got to be mindful of this when you're irritated. You know? Or you see a situation it's easy to throw a stereotype on a situation. Uh, man, I can't believe that. What's going on, you know? Yeah, but, you know, all these stereotypes, and you know, I can just go numerous examples of stereotypes, but that's something as a believer in Christ we have to fight against. And the only way you can fight against that is Romans 12, 1 and 2. You have to renew your mind in Christ daily. Meditation in the word of God. Studying the word of God. Being around people that challenge your way of thinking. Uh, because uh, sometimes we're not aware of the water that we swim in that is actually dirty until somebody from the outside says, hey, why are you swimming this way? Or why are you in this, right? So you need someone to say, mm, I don't know about that. I probably would say this. I, I don't necessarily think that's true in all situations. You need someone to challenge your worldview or your stereotypes sometimes when you have them. And I think that's so important um, as the body of Christ begins to grow uh, and begin to reach the nations. Uh, we need to be mindful when we pray for other church members. Yeah, I know they're going through this situation, but if they just do this, everything will be all right. You have to really uh, put yourself in that person's shoes and see, I don't really understand what you're going through. Help me understand. Um, really willing to take what I know and put it on the back burner uh, and then open myself up to be a learner and praying that the gospel uh, be able, is able to permeate whatever situation you're in or whatever situation you're dealing with. So be mindful of this or when you pray for other church members. Use your imagination. I uh, just mentioned this, but I never watched this, but I, I like the concept of it. Uh, the Undercover Boss on CBS. It's where a high executive uh, dresses up as an ordinary worker and comes to work, and he actually gets to experience the good, the bad, and ugly, and what people actually think about him. But guess where they first got that idea from? Think hard. Isn't that what Jesus did? <laughs> the greatest undercover boss, right? Put on flesh. Became a baby in a manger. So that's, he's our faithful high priest. 
We can take all our concerns, all our problems to him because he knows. Been there. I know what you're going through. And he's able to help us. That's why the Bible teaches us to cast all our cares upon him because he cares about us. And so in our mind, when we're thinking about, um, we just need to realize who Christ is. And that comes with the renewing of our mind. And put ourselves in that other person's position and imagine what they're going through. And that will affect your prayer life. Ask questions. Here's the wrong way to ask a question. I don't understand your people. Can you tell me how it is to be black or how to be Asian? You know, that's the wrong way. Uh, I was actually uh, in Glasgow, Kentucky, and uh, we was at, what's it? No. See, the Captain D's along John Silver. And this lady, I know she well meaning, came up to my wife and says, You know what? I just want to let you know, I really love the movie Blindside. It was, you know, and I was like, I was like, oh my, we laugh about that to this day. She's like, I just read, oh, what she did for that African American boy. I just love that movie. And uh, so when we're having a bad day and I always say, honey, I love that movie Blindside. And we just bust out laughing. Or I was in seminary for this next example, the classroom. Somebody left some chopsticks in the classroom. So the instructor taped them to the bulletin board, right? Uh, so when, uh, well, whatever the chart board, she taped them up there. So a well-meaning student, uh, Asian-American student walked in and was like, hey, uh, Blah, blah, blah. Are those your chopsticks? And this was one day I wasn't feeling the most godly. And so I said, this is just like having a fried chicken stick up there and say, hey, Brian, is that your piece of chicken? And she was like, oh, I didn't think of that. I was like, yeah, we probably need to work on that. Oh, so, uh, you know, sometimes I know it's probably rude to do that, but when she graduated, she, pre she thanked me for that, you know. So we have to really be <laughs> aware. So here's the right way to do it. Hey, I have cultural blind spots and want to be a better steward of unity in the church. How do you feel about seeing this event on TV? How did this event affect you? So now, instead of a science project or a museum exhibit, you know, I, hey, National Geographic, here it is. Hey, I want to be a student. I'm a fellow image bearer. Help me to be a better student. And so you see the questions are different, right? Wrong way, right way. Right? Wrong way, right way. <laughs> All right. And sometimes the wrong way <laughs> can be really wrong. I've had, uh, it'd be surprised the wrong ways I've received in life. Uh, but um, by being in Christ, it really changes your perspective on a lot of things. And so you really have to be uh, really in the word and study. Otherwise, you'll have these cultural blind spots. And, you're, and you might be serving the Lord, but this blind spot keeps you from serving God to the fullest potential. Right? And so I think that's very key. Uh, be zealous and have constant love. Uh, don't be slothful, lazy, and showing zeal or eagerness. So um, don't, for example, this class. It was like, hey, I went to the class. I'm good. I'm done. Right? Um, then so, oh, I'm in the class again, so I need to do this. No, this should be, you should have an eagerness because diversity and unity is a gospel issue. You should have an eagerness to live out the Great Commission and in the Great Commission, you see it. In Revelation 7 and 9, you see it. So this should be a genuine eagerness to want to live in such a way. We want to have a picture of the kingdom of God here. Let's have it in our church. Let's be a model for every church in this region that, hey, we're uh, gospel-focused, gospel-centered, and you can see it in the diversity within our church. That bespeaks volumes to the world that says, 
you only can be on the same level if you're willing to say every God is the same, every lifestyle is the same, God loves you no matter what. No. When you have, we stand, we hold a high view of Scripture, and it's the diverse community that which we worship God in, it says a lot. It says a lot about who Christ is. And that's why you see Acts 6, it was so important that they called a meeting because unity and diversity is a gospel issue. Uh, be fervent in spirit. Be hot. No one has to warm you up to do this. This should be uh, something you do naturally. Uh, so, for example, if I ask some person for a cup of water, and I'm like, oh, okay, here you go. You know, I, I really don't want the water. <laughs> you can keep it, you know. But if he was like, sure, how can I serve you? What's going on? You know, that's a different attitude. All right, let me look for some friends that are African-American uh, in our age group. Uh, they have to like U.K. basketball, though. No Louisville fans. Uh, they got to have kids. They got to be Christians. And you have these criteria that you have in order to befriend someone of a different ethnic group or a different cultural background. You got to meet these categories. But life is messy. Discipleship is messy. Think about Jesus' disciples. You got Peter cutting people and stuff. Jesus ministering to him. He's always putting his foot in his mouth. You got people wanting to call down the thunder because they ain't doing it their way. So Jesus got a, just a hodgepodge of people, and yet he spent three years with them. So how much is, uh, you're not getting it. I'm the Christ. I'm the Son of God. Man, Jesus, you talk, man, forget that. No one's going to leave you. They might leave you. I'm not going anywhere. You have to have a lot of patience to deal with reaching others. And so even in college ministry, uh, which is one aspect of my job, if I base what I do based on the number of people that come, I'll be frustrated. There's times where I got a nice group, and there's times when there's two or three. Um, there's a, what helped me out tremendously was when I first served in another church, and we did nursing home ministry. So every Friday, we would go to a nursing home, and it may be one, it may be two, we sang hymns, we prayed, we did a full sermon to that one person as if it's 500 in the room. And it taught us that whether there's one person or whether there's a room full, they need the gospel. And so if you base the gospel on numbers, you're not going to go far because there's going to be a time where there's not a lot of people. Uh, another good example is Shylan came to do a concert in Bradford Hall. And we had Flame the year before. Uh, we had more numbers for Flame. Not that many people showed up for Charlene. and But Charlene didn't care. He performed as if it was a packed house. And that spoke volumes. Everyone there enjoyed it. I mean, he was like there was a full house, and he was rocking it. And so that's the way we have to do ministry. No matter what the numbers look like, no matter who's here and who's not here, we perform for the audience of one. And actually don't perform. We worship to the audience of one. And that's Jesus Christ. And that's in whatever avenue the Lord has you in. It's to the audience of one. Uh, serve the Lord. We saw this earlier. You only can serve the Lord if you don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. We talked about that. And also, we see something else in 14 through 21. What do we see there? Anybody? Right. So he's talking about your Christian aspect is different, right? So how you do things. Um, only way you serve is you got to have a different Mind frame of approaching life, and it starts in Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's a renewing of your mind, right? Being transformed. Now, metamorphosis happens in your life in order for you to really serve 
as you should. And you serve one another. You're serving the body of Christ. Uh, he mentions that in here as well, that there's many members, but they're all different. But as you serve one another, you're serving the body of Christ. That's how we serve the Lord. <clears throat> there's a uh, joyful expectation that things will change. So that motivates me. That's why I'm eager. That's why I'm zealous, because... I have a, a joyful hope that things will change and the gospel will change situations. The question is, are we willing to be constant and consistent in doing gospel things? Steady in adversity. Remember overlooking the offenses for unity's sake. We see this in Acts 6. And I, okay, I, I do this event and someone curses me out and tell me Jesus is a fake. But I reached three or four other people. Am I willing not to go back to that group because of that one person? Think about it. Jesus, somebody spat up on him, pierced him inside. He could have said, you know what, God, this is too much. I'm out of here. No. But that, his mind, his focus, his will was to do the will of the Father. And his mind was fixed on Calvary. He came here with the expectation, dying on the cross to pay for the sins of the sheep. That was his goal. That was his mindset. How much more should it be our goal and mine to live out gospel principles for unity and diversity because it's a gospel issue? Uh, constant in prayers about the issues. If I have a joyful expectation that things will change, I know only God can do it. So I need to be constant as I pray about these issues and constant in the aspiration to invest in diversity and unity, right? Sacrificial, am I willing to give of my resources? Uh, I love the Houston relief effort that we did as a church, collecting items, people gave money. Time, what would I have to give up in order to show hospitality? Um, miss out family time in order to minister to someone else. Um, I've taken time to pick up students, to bring them to church. And, you know, what are you willing to give up? Are you, um, there's been students come to my house on Saturdays. Uh, I went to family time, and we're, they got marital issues. I'm talking to them. I'm taking out time to deal with them and taking away time from my family. But that's a sacrifice because the gospel is important. Uh, and we talked about Philippians 2, 5 through 11 already. Here's some questions to consider. Are you familiar with people enough that's outside of your regular network? Um, and be aware of their physical needs and think, how could I meet them? Or how I can put, point them to resources? Can I give? Can I give them my time, my resources? Is there something I can do to help this situation? I know this sister. I know this brother. How can I give? Uh, in our deacon meeting, um, there was a brother who has a problem walking and stuff. And he asked for volunteers to help out. Can I give him my time and resource to help out to relieve this brother in order to fit in? Uh, willing to give up preferences for others. Well, my group likes to do this, but am I willing to give up our preferences in order to reach someone else who has a different preference, but it's an opportunity? One thing I'm considering, uh, the, there's a, a basketball league here at the church, right? And it's Tuesdays and Thursdays. I probably only can play Thursday if I play, but I'm considering doing it because my brother said he would play in it, and I know he's going through a tough patch right now, so I'm thinking maybe by doing this, I can build some more relationship with him and point him to Christ. So am I willing? My body is like, man, we're doing well enough to manage one game a week, you know? So you got to think about that. So I have been considering it. Oh, um, are you willing to go unnoticed? This is what was mentioned earlier. Are you willing to do something and people are not aware of it? 
Are you just willing to just nice to be nice? God sees it, and that's good enough for me. Is that your mantra? Or, hey, I'm going to send this email into the church office. This is what I just done. Just, you know, try to serve Christ. Just want to let you all know, you know. Uh, are you willing to go unnoticed? Are you willing to give up opportunities to serve others? I got an opportunity to do this, but here's our opportunity to serve. Am I going to do what I really be fun and joyful or am I going to serve? And these are some tough questions you have to ask yourself. Um, it comes here, and please don't hear me saying you have to do a lot of stuff in order to fulfill the will of God for your life. you got to be involved in everything. I'm not saying that. Um, you need to have a balanced life with family, with work, whatever it is. But within your balance, is there some sacrifices you can make? To serve others. All right. And in close, remember next week. All right.